Hello everyone and welcome to today's Kerbal Space Program video and it is finally the day that we fly the Behemoth SSTO, a 500 seat Leviathan with the range to fly practically anywhere in the Kerbin system, thanks Kerbal system I should say, thanks to a uh, mining unit on board. Now I know some people roll their eyes when they see an SSTO use mining and that it doesn't really count but I've done quite a lot of SSTOs that don't use the um, Convertitron unit and I thought just to squeeze the most potential out of a ship this size, uh, mining was really the way to go. So in this video, um, well in this mission we're going to be flying ourselves into low carbon orbit before stopping off at Minmus to fully refuel ourselves and then we're going to head off to the dual system to land on Leith. Now this video ended up taking quite a long time so a lot of it you're going to see is sped up. This thing actually takes a very very long time to fly, it's extremely slow. Uh, and the part count means that the frame rate is pretty much always below 10 at any given point. And my PC is probably better than yours. And so, you know, this thing is, it's, it's, it's a bit of a chore to fly, which is why, that's why this video has been so long in the making. Not because it's been taking a long time to edit or anything like that. It's just taken so long to just do the flight really so I kind of filmed it in stages just so I wouldn't completely lose my sanity now I'm not going to go too into the specifics of flying this thing or the mission in detail just because you should not be attempting this kind of mission unless you like are able to fly SSTOs like really really easily it's just it, this is like I said this is probably the hardest SSTO to fly I've ever made um, so I don't want to if you if you need to have a guide to help you fly it you shouldn't be trying to fly. I don't want to sound patronizing or that it's like some I'm like some godly skilled player, but this is this is very difficult to fly. Um, I would definitely point you towards the direction of my Phantom class or even Argus class SSTOs if you're just starting out. Links to which are always in the description uh, on my forum post. But um, I talked about this briefly on my Planet Coaster video where I wanted to talk more about other things in videos rather than just directly talking about the gameplay a lot of the time, especially since, like I said before, I don't want to get too much into making this into a guide um, because this SSTO really isn't aimed at people who need guides still. So maybe I'll, I'll just talk about some things. I haven't really thought about, you know, scripting these or anything, but one of my one of my favourite topics is uh, death. <laughs> uh, well, no, 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 it's not. But um, one of the stories that I think is more interesting about uh, something that a, a unique thing that I've experienced that I think most people haven't is my time spent at university working in the dissection rooms with the dead bodies. <laughs> a lot of people get a bit f get get kind of really fascinated or intrigued in a sort of really morbid sense um, about the prospect of like working on actual human like cadavers and. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, because I don't know if this, maybe this isn't a very a topic that people would be comfortable with, but um, I think it's quite interesting anyway, because, well actually I'm just going to preface this entire story by saying, watching this on screen, I will not be putting any videos or pictures or any kind of graphical imagery res relating to dead bodies or medical school cadavers or anything, so if you are squeamish about this sort of thing, I'm not going to be showing any pictures on screen, and if this is the sort of thing that you know, it turns you off a little bit, or perhaps isn't something you want to listen to, then I'm going to put a link in the description for a album, one my, my favourite album, hands down my favourite album of all time, is in the description. I know a lot of people comment, compliment me on my taste in music, particularly my older videos where I would just put music over the missions rather than, you know, my, my voice. Um, so you can go ahead and give that a listen to uh, whilst you watch this video instead, but um, but yeah, let's get on to the story. Actually, before I do, uh, on screen now there is a time code to the point at which I stop talking about dead bodies. So if you want to just skip, if you want to just skip ahead or just unmute the video at that point, then you can. Anyway, when, when I remember, the, I remember the day I was back. What if I call it? I was an idiot, eighteen-year-old, probably hungover from some night out the day, the night before. Um, we got to the dissection chambers in the uh, biomedical sciences building, and uh, the surgeon came out. So we were all kind of waiting outside in our, in our white coats and, like, and gloves and everything. We were waiting outside the room, having never been in there before. And the head surgeon comes out and gives us this really scary talk about, right, so he's, he's from the north. So he's like, right, so it's, it's, it can be quite disturbing for some people. So if you feel like you're going to collapse or you feel like you're going to be sick or you feel like you're going to get lightheaded, just leave. Just leave. Just keep your head to the ground so you can't see any of them. 
and you can just go we won't stop you or anything like that and i'm like oh bloody hell okay and then it says now we've had we've had they had to ban mobile phones in that room as well because people start people apparently were taking pictures of the bodies which i think is really weird so we had to leave our phones in like lockers outside and then we all went inside and I think the thing that sort of took me by surprise the most was like how much it defied my expectations of what a dissection room would look like. Like I think everyone has this idea of what like a kind of a, a morgue would be like. It's like like I see in TV shows where you go into the room and it's got this big metal wall with loads of big drawers on it and you pull the drawer out and that's it pulls out and that's got the bed with the body on it and things and then when you finish you just cl you push the drawer back in and the body goes away again not like not like that wasn't what that wasn't what it, the um that wasn't the experience i had it was we walked into this giant room and it was just filled with like beds it was almost like a kind of really weird sort of hospital ward almost but rather than having obviously beds with patients they were just metal beds or just metal tables i imagine i guess with just bodies on them just out there in the open uh they're all they were all old people obviously people that would have died young um or or like just out of suspicious circumstances uh would have had autopsies and things like that and so they wouldn't have been in a medical school dissection room so they're all old people and I think the, one of the more surprising things, I mean, I knew this was going to be the case beforehand, but for those of you that might not have known about this, um, they were all completely hairless. Like, none of them had a single hair on their body. And yes, even down there. That's, it's funny. Most of the people I speak to, the first thing they always ask, I'm talking, I'm going to keep the, um, keep taboo language uh, to a minimum, but they ask along the lines of, uh, what is the general aesthetic appearance of the genitalia, usually of the male bodies? And um, I don't know. I mean, uh, blood clots there, so uh, it looked look very black. I, I didn't really spend a lot of time looking down there, to be honest. Mainly because I was working more on the brain and the eyes, because that's my that was my field of study. Like um, I didn't, I wasn't studying medicine, so I wasn't doing the entire body. We were just looking mainly at head and neck and sock eye socket and things, which. I guess does fall under head and neck. Um, so for those of you who are going to ask in the comments, they're very black, very shriveled. <laughs> I can't believe I want to describe this now. This is the quality content. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to everyone that donates on Patreon that you've just thrown your money at me and I've just been squandering on making stuff like this. Yeah, I think one of the other things that stood me surprised as well is the fact that they really don't look real. Like, you know, I don't know if I've never, I've actually never seen a dead body outside the context of, you know, the medical school dissection rooms. But I know, like, open casket funerals, if films are to be, are to be believed or anything like that, is that they generally, you generally imagine it to look like a real person who's just asleep. Although, fun fact, the eyes are usually open uh, in dead people, so they have to put these, like, special, um, clawed things on the eyeball itself to hold the lids closed. Anyway, besides the point, you always imagine it to look like just sort of a, a, a real person that's just asleep or unconscious. But these people, for whatever reason, well, there was a reason, obviously, but they didn't look real. And I know anyone that's gone into dissection rooms or anything like that <coughs> will know this as well. They really don't look like real people. They look like they're made, they'd almost look like dummies made of leather. Just because the skin is very dry, they've been, like, obviously they've been drained and things but yeah it's, it's, it's something i can't really describe i mean maybe there's some images on google let me just check google yeah i guess if you i'm not putting any images on screen don't worry but i guess if you do search google just looking at these now um that goes if you type in like medical school cadaver or something that kind of gives off that's those are the kind of the same things they look a little bit like horror movie almost like horror movie props in the sense that they look they don't look real but they definitely fall into the uncanny valley that they have these sort of gaping mouths very yellowed skin very strange. The other thing that I was kind of surprised by, by the way, if I've just suddenly started sounding quieter, it's because I realised just looking at the, looking at my screen, I've just been kind of rambling, just looking around my room, without paying attention to what's being recorded. I was noticing I was peeking a lot, so things things are getting very distorted like this. So I, I think I fixed that now, but it might have made things quieter. But yeah, as I was saying, another surprising thing was just how crude i mean i guess it's not surprising when you think about it it's a bunch of teenagers or, or sort of young 20 somethings hacking away at these bodies it means that the cuts and the way in which they were dissected were not neat like one for example the one immediately to our right where we were hanging up our coats like about four feet away from them there was this body with no arms 
Uh, but rather than it being a clean cut, it was very raggedy, like bits of bone sticking out. Like, oh, there goes the, just talking about the video, there goes the drill and the ladder. And I guess we can just put Jeb on an EVA. Um, we have a command module inside the cargo bay, by the way, that connects to the ladder that you can then transfer crew from. So this thing can have Kerbals on EVA and things on places like Lathe or Eve, although it won't get back from Eve, but you could have an EVA and then get back on the ship okay. Um, yeah, they weren't, they weren't clean cuts or anything. It was very jagged, very rough, and this particular body also had an empty chest cavity. Like, the entire chest, it had been, the ribs had been removed and every organ had been taken out, which was really, it was really odd to look at, actually, because it was clearly someone's head and legs, but they had no arms. It was just very raggedy, jaggedy, sort of shoulder, like, ball socket, but part of the bone from the arm was still in there. Uh, and then the actual chest cavity, it looked like it had been ripped open. You know, the classic picture of, like, the Hulk tearing off his shirt, like, the state of that shirt. That's kind of what the cavity, the skin was around it. And then there was just ribs were missing and the organs were missing. There was kind of just a sort of hollow purple chamber, really, almost. It was, it was I didn't really look to, I wasn't really, uh, we, we were kind of having to move to our table. I never really got to have a good look at it. But it was very, yeah, it was really, it was really fascinating to look at, actually. Um, and I remember one of the more, one of the more memorable days was when we went to the dissection rooms. And the surgeon who was supervising us that day, um, we kind of went, we walked along the uh, the aisle <laughs> of tables. So all the tables had bodies on them. We got to the one at the end. And the table that we were supposed to get, we were in like a group of about six people. And the, the table that we were standing around, it didn't have a body on it. It just had one of these, it just had a big bucket on it. If you ever went to like a hardware store, or like B&Q if you're in England, or Home Depot, is that the equivalent of B&Q in the US? One of these where you can get big buckets of paint. Uh, you know, the big paint, like the big plastic tubs with the plastic lids. It was like that sort of bucket. So the lid was on, and the surgeon was standing there, he was holding a literal knitting, knitting needle. Like, not even an instrument that looked like a knitting needle, it was a knitting needle. And he basically said, so... Who wants to tell me about the cranial nerves of the orbit? And we're all kind of just sort of avoiding eye contact at this point because we don't really know where this where this question is leading. Unfortunately, I was happened to be standing next to him and I sort of glanced at him and made eye contact. And that was it. That was enough for him to say, Matt, would you like to tell us? <laughs> My accent has been all over the place. He was kind of, I think he was Egyptian, to be honest, in terms of his origins. So I've just been completely butchering that impression, but... He goes, Matt, you can you can talk us through it. And he just hands me the knitting needle and I was like, um, alright. <laughs> it's like I didn't wanna you know, I didn't want, I didn't want to defy him or anything. So I he, then he just hands me the knitting needle, turns to the turns his attention to this bucket, takes the lid off, and it's kind of filled with this sort of translucent fluid. He reaches in and just produces a head and plops it on the table. I say head, it wasn't the entire head. It would kinda of, it had kind of been cut in half from like the back so if you imagine from the top of the skull down through where the ears are down like kind of horizontally so the front of the face was all intact but there was no back to it it was like that obviously the brain was missing as well and i had to point out for those of you who know about the cranial nerves uh, i had to point out the pathway of the third nerve so this connects uh, four of the six uh, eye muscles to the brain itself so i had to find the actual nerve and you know, trace its path back. So I was sticking the needle through in between the eyeball and the lid, just sticking it through that gap there all the way to the back. Obviously, the, conjunct the conjunctiva, which would normally prevent you from doing that to a real person, had been cut away. Uh, this was a very old head. It had been used quite a, quite a number of times, I'd imagine. Um, so pointing out the path of this nerve. But that that was a really bizarre thing to see. Also, holding a, holding a human brain as well. I mean, granted... This was a dead brain. A real brain, I'm told, is very, very mushy, almost like porridge in terms of its consistency. This was a preserved brain of formaldehyde, so, you know, it wasn't really representative of what a real brain is like, a living brain is like, I should say. And um, one thing I was in, I, that took me a little bit by surprise by the brain was how heavy it was. Like, I was expecting it to be fairly... I, I couldn't... I can't really think of anything that was of equivalent weight, really. Um... But it was just a lot heavier than I was expecting it to be. I was expecting it to be kind of this sort of, kind of like a baseball in terms of weight. Maybe not quite that light, but that kind of weight. But no, it was heavy. Uh, it was it was heavy for what I th what it was. And I guess that does make sense when you think about it. But that was another thing that surprised me. Um, but yeah, I think I was just surprised by how little 
the body's really affecting me. I know one person did collapse the first time I went there, but I was, I was, I was just completely fascinated from them by day one. Like it's one of those things that I always thought I'd be fascinated by, but I thought I bet when I actually see it in reality, the the reality of it will hit me. I'll be like, oh my god, that's a person. I need to get out of here. But no, I was fascinated <laughs> by from day one. I loved, I loved the dissection rooms. So, you know, that's kind of. That's my story of seeing dead people. So, uh, I guess anyone that wasn't, so anyone that wasn't, didn't want to listen to that story, um, hello and welcome back. Um, I finished talking about dead people now and I'm not going to touch on the stuff, sub t the subject again, unless a lot of people ask for it in the comments and I can maybe explore a little bit more. But yeah, that was my story of seeing dead people. And here we are arriving at the dual system. So we're doing the standard dual system capture of using Tylo, but, uh, this ship is just so unwieldy to fly that I ended up doing not a particularly great job of it and had to do... Uh, I, I completely fudged the burn and my Tylo capture didn't actually get me into a circular Tylo orbit so what I did was a burn at Tylo periapsis just to get myself captured at Jewel. But even that was a very poor and very very inefficient capture. But, you know, for one thing, I can do it. If you, if you, if you have a look at my latest, my most recent video besides this one, the Blunderbirds video in which we go to Val, uh, I do a pretty efficient Tylo capture there as well as my other Lathe SSTO videos. Uh, I didn't, efficiency was not really important here because we can refuel and like I say, this thing was so, un, so slow and laborious to do anything. It was just so tedious. I really couldn't be bothered to, to keep doing the burn again and again until I got the until I got an optimal Tylo capture, so we're just going to do a burn here. Yeah, talking about the just the, the difficulty of flying this thing, like it's not that it's difficult, it's just everything is very slow. It's so slow. Like, as I record this, yesterday I was filming bits for a another SSTO. This was a Phantom class SSTO, which is a class that, while not as technically impressive as the bigger SSTOs, I like flying Phantom class SSTOs more than anything else, just because they're so... They're just fun to fly. They're small. The frame rate is always about 30 to 60, which for KSP is pretty good. And, you know, I was having so much fun flying it from flying this thing because burns would not take 10 hours to do. <laughs> Exaggerating here, obviously, but yeah, just this was just not fun. Like, all maneuvers took a very long time. If I, if I overshot a burn, I'd have to turn it around, which would add another, just a minute of just sitting there waiting for the ship to spin around. Like, you can see I'm doing a lot of crossfades here. And there's a lot of temperature gauges here, although it did manage to capture at Lathe okay. Once again, for the record, this is filmed at 100% re-entry heating. So, yeah, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to make another SST of this kind of size, to be honest. I mean, it really just isn't fun, honestly. And that is why I say that uh, anyone who's not advanced to this game shouldn't be attempting to fly this thing. And that's why I've kind of re I've made the decision to not put the craft file in the description. For one thing, because I got to hit, it took a lot of work to get a get this thing working. And I kind of want that if you if you want to make an S do this, you'd put the work in as well, all right? <laughs> and you know if you're if you if you need to download the craft file to make this, something like this then you shouldn't be flying it. And if you're good enough at this game, you can easily reverse engineer it based on what you're watching here. So there is no craft file in the description because honestly, I don't think no one deserves this kind of pain. No one deserves this kind of pain. This this does work, honestly. I mean, I shouldn't need to explain that to you. Uh, for the landing here, I'm just going to activate night vision uh, using post, post processing, uh, well, you know, video effects. Just because the ground was pitch black, I couldn't see what I was doing. I just had to guesstimate it, and luckily it worked, but for the viewer, you can actually look, now I've turned it off, you can't even see the ground, so thought I'd activate that. But yeah, this thing does work, I mean, and I just don't, I just, I just kind of, I just kind of wanted to keep this as a personal project. I, do, I don't really like, I don't really want other people, uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's just a completely selfish thing, but you know, if you're, if you, if you are good enough at the game to be able to fly it, the content in this video should be more than enough. Like I've been showing the resources panel and Delta V and all that. You should be able to build it from this video, but I urge you for the love of God, don't. <laughs> because it is not fun. And it's just, it's just not fun. That's ultimately what it comes down to. It's just a pain in the ass to fly. So I think, I, I originally planned for it to be designed as a colony ship, like it would fly somewhere and stay there as a permanent base or something like that. So 
this video has already gone on long enough. Like we're almost approaching 20 minutes, which is a point at which I don't like my videos being any longer than 20 minutes. So I'm probably going to leave it there. We're re fully refueling it. So once, so we have, we are now full of fuel. So it's a given that we can now easily get back to Kerbin, even in the most inefficient flight method. For the record, I will show that it is possible to take off from Lathe and get into a stable Lathe orbit in the most inefficient way possible, actually. We're taking off 270 degrees, so exactly backwards along the rotation of the planet, just to fully illustrate that it is possible to get this thing into orbit, and from there, we could easily get back to Kerbin, or even if you couldn't personally, we could just go to Bop or Pol, land there, because we could land on Minmus, so obviously we can land on Pol or, Pol or Bop, uh, fully refuel and have even more Delta V in dual orbit. And I think it's not the most... I mean, you've already watched me get to Lathe, and I've, this video's been long enough. I don't think it's going to be that in, interesting to watch me get back to Kerbin. I mean, I've made SSTOs in which I get to go <laughs> switching to closed cycle mode there as I realize I'm starting to nosedive back towards the surface. Uh, but yeah, so I don't, I don't want this video to sound too downerish or anything, but yeah. I just I've no, I have no interest at all in building another SSDO of this kind of scale. I mean, I say that next month they're going to come back with one. Hey guys, this one's five times the size, but... For now, that prospect of doing something like that just doesn't doesn't sit well with me. Anyway, so that's kind of this flight, this SSTO and the dead people story. Um, shout out to this video's sponsor. It's not a sponsor, but this video was recorded using Ac uh, Marillis Action Video Recorder, which is a software I've not used before. Uh, for those of you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen me recently express disdain for NVIDIA Shadow Play. Like I just, I've just grown sick of it. I've just grown sick of NVIDIA and their stupidity in terms of whenever there's a GeForce update, they just reset all of my shadow play uh, settings so that I'll suddenly start capturing things that will just start recording microphone foot audio when I'd never set it up that way, just there was an update and so NVIDIA decided, hey, I think we think you should be doing this. It's like, no, NVIDIA, I didn't want you to do that, but now that entire video is ruined because it's just constantly just me breathing in the background and just my computer fans. Uh, and just things like that, they'll just drop, the, like I, I record at the highest bit rate, Nvidia will just drop that back down to like a medium bit rate for literally no reason. I'm just like, stop messing with my so now I just don't trust them anymore. So I just don't use Nvidia Shadow Play anymore. And just like if you've seen my um, SSTO to Elu, part of that footage, luckily it was a very unimportant segment of the mission, but part of it was just just stopped recording altogether. Like it was just a black screen with glitched audio for an hour, and I was like, bloody hell. So uh Marillis Action Video, what they they actually reached out to me, they approached me and was like, hey. Would you be interested in trying out our software? Here's a license key. It's not a free piece of software, unfortunately, but here's a lifetime license key for you to try out. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm always open to suggestions. I've been using Fraps for a bit now. But um, even though, obviously, I, was, I got this for free, so there is obviously always going to be some bias. But trying to speak objectively here, I really like it. It's the best. It has the best user interface out of all of them, and I used Bandicam, Shadowplay, and Fraps. And, you know, it has the best user interface and just the nicest experience overall, I think. So, yeah, uh, Marillis Action has the Matlan endorsement. So maybe I'll do some giveaways of keys in the future or just, you know, have an affiliation code associated with my channel. But, you know, um, I, yeah, again, just trying to, trying to make, remain objective here. Like, disregarding the fact that I, I got a free copy of it, I really like Marillis Action. So... It's definitely worth a try. I think ultimately Fraps does have better output quality, but the file sizes are much bigger, so there's that. And we're talking about YouTube video compression as well, so I don't think it really makes much of a meaningful difference in the mean in the long run. So anyway, that's that, and that's this mission, and here we are in late orbit. So, other than that, I guess we can go to the outro screen. Top left is a more fun Lathe SS2 video. Doesn't require any mining and is 124 seat capacity so we go from Kerbin to Lathe to back and back again without any any refueling. Top right is just my most recent upload and bottom right was specially selected by YouTube's algorithm specifically for you. So other than that, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the videos.